This week, now that my porcelain workstation is set up, I'm trimming a few of the porcelain vases I threw at the end of last week's video. It's a process I always look forward to, mainly as I get to use a few tools which are saved specifically for trimming porcelain. I'll be using some metal kidneys, my very tiny and sharp bison turning tool, next to which is a much cheaper steel trimmer, which is practically worn out, but still very useful. Then there's my maker's mark, and at last, the four trimming tools that are reserved just for porcelain. They're made by a fantastically talented potter and a friend of mine who's called Jay Jun Lee. I'll leave a link to his website in the description below. The blades themselves are made from tungsten carbide, which makes these unbelievably hard and sharp, yet incredibly brittle, which means if they're dropped on the floor, there's a good chance the blade might shatter, or if they're used with a clay body that's highly grogged, the edge can chip like this, which I learned the hard way, hence why these days I only ever use these tools when I'm trimming porcelain pots. They're very special objects, and now that I have a more permanent porcelain workstation, I hope I'll get to use them more. So, those are the tools, but they don't always remain the same. New ones come and go, and I might have to seek out one particular shape if the pot I'm trimming demands it. To attach the vase down, I simply rub some water over the base, especially around the edge, and then I place it onto the metal wheel head before tap centering it into the middle. I then use the corner of a plastic kidney to just squash in the lowest portion of the pot against the metal. This creates an additional seal and just helps the pot to remain stuck down in place as I work. Now, before I start trimming, I just want to discuss some technique and proper arm and hand placement. What you definitely don't want to do is grasp the tool at the back, like this. You'll have very little control holding it this way, and you won't be able to push in with the blade firmly enough. Instead, you want to hold it much nearer to the end, fingers pressed in close around the blade. As I trim, I keep my left hand on the pot, and if possible, I try to brace my right hand that holds the tool against my left hand, as this helps to add stability to my trimming hand. To further aid this, I tuck my elbow of my right arm into my torso, and finally I just slightly lean my upper body weight onto that arm, and as my right hand grips the tool, I use my index finger to direct the pressure of the blade, making it dig in deeper or just skim the surface. I can even use the thumb of my left hand to help control the blade itself as it travels up the wall of the pot. And, if the pot allows for it, I'll insert the fingers of my left hand and feel opposite the area I'm trimming, so I can feel just how thick or thin it is. If you look closely, you can see that the rim of this pot undulates up and down as it spins. And so, to remove the worst of this, I'll grip my turning tool really firmly and begin trimming away at the highest point that spins around, lowering it ever so slightly as that high point becomes flatter and flatter until it runs more or less straight, but much of what will make it look better will come from when I trim the rim from the inside out. But for now, I still need to remove more porcelain from the body. As always, my movements are slow and steady, and from this angle you can easily see how I brace my two thumbs together. An old tutor of mine used to always describe the process of trimming as being a far more mechanical task as compared to throwing. It's the process of refining the shape and removing excess clay to make the pots feel lighter. And that's one thing with porcelain that I really push to the extreme. I want these porcelain vases to be as light as a feather. And as porcelain has this wonderful quality of almost appearing like glass when trimmed thinly, as in light and shadows can be seen through it, I want to make these as thin as I can, even if that means trimming away far more than what's conventionally removed. Jajun Lee's trimming tools leave much cleaner surfaces, so I tend to use these for the finishing pass. They are wonderful tools, but I certainly wouldn't say they're beginner friendly. All it takes is one wrong move for the blade to catch and for the pot to be dragged off center, and I have in the past even cut myself when using these. They're an investment too, as they're far more expensive than other cheaper conventional trimming tools but they are well worth it, especially if you're well versed with this process, and it's like using a very sharp knife in the kitchen, and these blades feel like they melt through the porcelain like a hot knife through butter. With these angular vessels, I try to make the corner where the angles change to be as crisp as possible, 
And that's another thing these tools excel at, is they have such fine tips, and they can be manoeuvred into these areas in a way loop tools can't. Trimming the inside portion of the rim and beveling it out to come to a much finer point is what will really correct a very subtle undulation in the rim. And this is one of the things I like most about porcelain. As a material, and especially compared to the slightly grobbed, coarse stoneware I normally use, porcelain can be trimmed to such a sharp edge. Now, I of course don't trim the entire pot as thin as I make the rim, as otherwise there's simply no way it would survive being glazed and fired. But by beveling a thickness from about 3.5mm to 1mm, you'll perceive how thin the pot is through the rim alone, despite the rest of the pot being slightly thicker and sturdier. Next I'll move on to the lower half of the pot, and once again both hands work together in order to keep that blade as stationary as possible as I move it up and down. I've been using some recycled porcelain, and I have been finding a few odd bits in it, such as this small piece of rubber, which I felt so acutely under the blade before I'd even uncovered it. This probably shows that my recycling method isn't the best, but it's easy enough just to dig whatever it is out. In this case, I could just trim past it, which means the crater it left wasn't a problem. In other cases, I'd plug that hole back up with clay and simply smooth it into the rest of the body, hiding it. Now it's time to trim the base, so I detach the pot by sliding a metal skim beneath it. I then pour out the trimmings and brush them away, just so there's nothing left on the wheel that might embed itself back into the delicate rim. And as long as I treat the pot carefully at this point, I shouldn't damage the thinly trimmed lip of the vessel. I then take three lumps of soft porcelain and press them around the rim. These secure the vase in place and secure the lower half of the pot and the base as I work. I also position a spinner on top, through which I push down really quite firmly, pinning the pot firmly down. After this section of the wall has been trimmed, the spinner itself is removed and I turn a beveled edge around the bottom of the pot. This takes away a tiny bit of the excess weight in the base of the pot, but more importantly, it creates a contact point that's less likely to chip. I then trim the very bottom of the vase, removing any wiring off marks and the slight grey-black stain you may have seen, which comes as the metal on the wheel head slightly rubs off onto the pristine white porcelain. I turn the surface flat and try finishing it in such a way that there are no maker's marks left visible. And then finally, I take my porcelain maker's mark and push it just ever so slightly into the base, gently rocking it from corner to corner so that it leaves a very legible impression. And with this vase done, I can move on to the next, which, although very similar in shape, was thrown more roughly and with a much more noticeable undulation in the rim. But the real reason I want to share this footage is so I can show you just how much the trimming process can change the appearance of a pot. Taking it from something that's irregular and undefined and turning it into something that's refined, light and delicate. Once slipped and centered, I once again make a seal at the bottom just to really make sure the pot's welded down and won't fly off the wheel as I'm trimming it. The key to correcting the wobbles in the form at this point is by holding the tool in such a way that it trims the high points first. You want the blade itself to simply slice away the undulating section as opposed to holding the tool limply and allowing the blade to simply bounce and follow the undulating surface of the pot, in which case your trimming will only really exaggerate the uneven form and it may end up looking even worse compared to the pot you began with. Truth be told though, it's because the vase is spinning around so quickly that the slight undulations look so obvious. If I were to simply stop the wheel, like so, your eye just no longer sees it. Next comes the base, and in this instance, I grasp the tool with two hands, with my wrists pressed together and braced on the plastic wheel tray. And the movement you see now isn't coming from my hands, but rather my wrists, as together they slowly pivot up. Whenever I'm trimming, I never push the blade against the metal of the wheel head, especially with these tungsten carbide turning tools, as the blades would chip so easily. So if there is a slight ridge left on the bottom of the pot, I won't try and trim it away at this point, Rather, I'll wait until I flip the pot upside down, and then I'll remove it. 
But for now, I'll just focus on removing the excess clay I felt in the base when feeling the vase's cross section before attaching it onto the wheel to be trimmed. With JJ and Lee's tools, I feel like I'm removing less clay with each pass, as compared to when I use my bison turning tools when trimming stoneware pots, but maybe that's just because I have more practice with the latter. I'll then try to deal with the undulation in the rim, removing the worst of it, at least. I will come back to this section and trim it from the inside out, but first I just want to make sure the shoulder and the outer portion of the lip are as neat and smooth as the waist and the lower section of the vase. With razor sharp tools and a clay body that's so smooth, I do find at times that it can be quite easy to get carried away and trim away too much. It feels like there's no resistance, especially compared to my grog stoneware. And strangely enough too, as this process is so silent and there's no sound of the tool tearing through the clay, I even find myself missing the response and the sounds made by trimming stoneware as if something informative is no longer there. To further fix the rim, I take this tiny loop turning tool and I roll it up and out the rim, beveling this edge and making it appear more even by thinning out what was a slightly thicker patch on one side of the rim. The vase is then detached and placed back down on a very clean surface so that no tiny trimmings of porcelain get stuck back into the delicately turned rim. If at this point I feel like the walls are very thin, I'll tap centre it very gently, as this process can, if you aren't careful, indent the sides of the pot, especially if they're turned thinly or the clay is relatively soft. The same can be said when attaching these porcelain lugs too, and if your pot is too soft and it's being deformed as these bits of clay are pushed against it, then it probably means that your pot is too soft to even be trimming. And this happens sometimes, as you're trimming a pot, you remove the firmer clay on the outside, revealing slightly softer clay underneath. And if you turn almost all the surfaces of a pot, like I do, pots can quite suddenly feel like they become wetter and less structurally sound. And in the instances that does happen, I'll just remove the pot and set it aside for an hour or two. Or, if I only have a tiny bit left to trim, I'll just blast it with a heat gun or use my gas torch. Despite the material's extreme sensitivities, as long as you forcibly dry it out evenly, it's amazing what you can get away with. And once trimmed, I used a flat metal kidney just to scrape over the surface, which removes some more obvious turning marks. I then trimmed the beveled edge, just knocking back that corner somewhat. And by all means, this isn't the only way you can finish the bottoms of your pots. You tend to find that each potter has their own particular way of doing it. Some may round that bottom edge, and others might trim a very slight hollow, an indented foot, like you might find in one of my trim bowls. Despite whatever you choose to do, the foot is a part of the pot that should never be forgotten, and there should always be some thought and consideration put into how this part of the pot is concluded. I then seal the vase with my maker's mark, like I do every pot I make. This little F in its indentation is my signature, more or less, and I hope it's how people will identify my work. Once flipped back the right way round, I saw that the rim needed a bit more turning. So I removed the lugs and really thoroughly cleaned the wheel head. I then placed the vase back and secured it in place with three lumps of porcelain. And then very carefully, I trimmed this lip just to be finer and making the inside section of the rim smoother, almost so it flows into the internal cavity more naturally. I knew this process would cause the base to be discoloured slightly, just around the edge, so I flipped the pot back upside down and just turned that part away. And at the same time I used the handle of my turning tool to burnish the bevel really smooth. And that's it. Finished and crisp, and really incredibly light. It almost feels like a completely different pot compared to that I started out with, and it's another piece I can add to my porcelain vase collection that's slowly growing, all of which I want to glaze incredibly simply to let the shapes speak, as opposed to their glaze surfaces. And that means I'll be glazing these with very thin washes of either black or white. That's the plan at least. Thanks as always for watching, and as I settle into what's usually the busiest part of my year, as I prepare for my Christmas online shop update, I hope I'm able to keep my posting schedule here to at least one video a week. But let's see. Thanks again especially if you make it all the way to the end.
and I'll see you next week.